I would like for everyone listening to this message to take a moment and think back to the earliest memory you have, good or bad. SubhanAllah, for most anything before the age of eight or nine is a blur, am I right? While looking through some old photo albums, I began to realize all the things that I have forgotten. From the places I've been to the hobbies and interests that I've outgrown. And then there are other things, people and certain events that no matter how long I live, I'll never forget. One example in my case is the girl in the blue dress. I don't even know her name, but I remember she had two buns on her head held together with pink hair clips, wearing a blue dress with white trim. I was about 12 years old, and the only reason that I remember this is because I remember that we were in Africa, and I remember that my first sibling had already been born, and also I remember that it was during my aunt's wedding. Strange the way the mind associates things, isn't it? But we'll get back to this later, inshallah. If you were to ask me anything else about that night, I couldn't tell you. Not what I ate, nor the music we danced to. I couldn't even tell you what I was wearing, but I'll never forget the girl in the blue dress because she gave me the most beautiful gift. It was a first time experience, and it was unresolved, meaning that I never got closure. I first noticed her while trying to get a better view of the bride and groom while they were doing the hinna portion of the wedding ceremony. While she was sitting on the windowsill, I was like, why didn't I think of that? Approaching the windowsill from the outside, I attempted to climb up and share the view. And when we were face to face, she gazed into my eyes a huge smile drawn in her face while hawking up the biggest wad of phlegm she could from her throat and nasal passages and let it fly, spitting directly on my face. SubhanAllah. What a beautiful gift. <laughs> Better than a first kiss. Alhamdulillah. From it, I derived this lecture titled Forgive and Forget. Now, I suppose somewhere in the deep recesses of my heart, I'm still hoping to run into this girl. To thank her, of course. And that's why I still remember this moment in my life. You see, she ran off afterwards and got lost in the crowd of people. But here I am regardless, three decades later, still holding on to a few seconds that I'll never forget. Are there things that you are yet to forget? Even better, are there feelings attached to those memories? Do those feelings impact the way you behave? How about this question? Do you remember the first attestment, meaning the first thing that you swore to be true? Let me jog your memory. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ And remember, when your Lord brought from the loins of the children of Adam their descendants and had them testify against themselves, Allah asked, Am I not your Lord? وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ And they replied, Yes, you are. We testify. شَهِدْنَا أَن تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْغِيَامَةِ إِنَّ كُنَّ عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ and he cautioned you, now you have no right to say on the day of judgment on Yom al Riyamah, of this we were unaware. Surely no one remembers this conversation with Allah. If we did, we wouldn't be in this state that we are in right now. We wouldn't be living heedless lives. What we do have from that conversation is a feeling. The feeling you get when listening to the Quran, the satisfaction that you get for doing good deeds in the sake of Allah, it's the same feeling that made you take the time to watch this video, subhanAllah. An experience combined with an emotion translating into a long-term behavioral pattern. What if as a child we were rewarded for the bad things that we did and disciplined for the good? Better yet, what if as a child you weren't rewarded for all your academic achievements or passing exams and things like that, but rather making salah and memorizing the verses of the Quran? Just something to think about. You see, we have made a covenant with Allah, and Allah has commanded us against certain behavior and towards others. It's that simple. Unfortunately, we're brainwashed even before we enter this world. From the womb, we are already receiving habits from the mother who bears us. I recall a funny story of this brother whose daughter 
loved candy so much. She, <laughs> but the doctor said, Khalas, she has to start cutting back on sweets. So one day while at the store with her father, she asked him, Daddy, please. And he said, I'm sorry, sweetheart, but we don't have enough money for that right now. In reality, he just wanted to end the conversation quickly. Later that weekend, they had some guests come to their home, and as a part of the culture, they offered them candy and drinks when they come in. So the little girl quickly began taking these things back to the kitchen, cup by cup, and eventually the tray. And one of the guests, teasing her, asked, you don't want us to have anything? And the little girl replied, sorry, we have to save it because daddy doesn't have enough money. I'm sure that you ran into this type of situation before, something very similar with children. SubhanAllah, do you see my point on heedlessness? How many people have brushed off someone with a lie? Even if there weren't consequences that you can see that came back to you, believe me, shaitan is using that lie in some way. And this is why as Muslims, we should mean what we say and say only what we mean, especially around children. Just as your parents taught you to lie, you are teaching them all the same things. And they're learning from you all the time, from your habits, from your behavior, from the way you deal with things, subhanAllah. These are the things that we remember even without remembering them. It's hard-coded programming. The way we deal with our problems, the way we confront individuals, our goals and priority in life, all of this is from our upbringing. It's inherited. And so the first step towards proper guidance is to forget. Why is it that we remember some things and not others? Wallahi, one can say these are one of the miracles of Allah. In my opinion, those key moments, just like the mystery of a deja vu, are things that have shaped us in some way. They have programmed the way you act and react to certain situations, even our goals and aspirations. We are constantly pushed to achieve more, to get a better status, seeking recognition and fame and acceptance in this dunya, but forgetting the goal that Allah has sought out for us. It is Allah who sends down clear revelation to his servant to bring you out of the darkness and into the light. For indeed Allah is ever gracious and most merciful to you. Allah has provided us the objective and the reason we were placed on this earth. The darkness he references can only be described as all the things that we need to forget within the context of this lecture. And these are the distractions of the dunya. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al dunya mal'una. The world is cursed and so is everything in it. Mal'una ma fiha illa dhikrullah. Except the remembrance of Allah. Those who have hurt us in some way are all the bad things that have ever happened to you. The things we have lost out on or missed opportunities, even the things we have attained or are striving for, are all cursed, so we should forget them. They all tie back to non-suitable character traits in Islam. Traits of wanting to seek revenge towards someone that spit on your face or treated you unfairly or disrespectfully. Traits like bragging and boastfulness. Have you ever heard someone say, do you know who I am? As if you're supposed to be impressed by their title or they deserve some type of special treatment. As a matter of fact, try to forget anything and everything in this world except the remembrance of Allah. Not in the literal sense, don't go quit your job, okay? But decrease the value that you give these things in your life, especially over the things that we should be remembering, like the example above for children. Is it more important for them to get closer to Allah in life or to achieve a PhD? If you've completed your studies and started a job at an entry level, it's almost inevitable that you'll eventually be promoted, right? But you see people jumping from job to job, relocating, leaving their homes, leaving their families, leaving their countries because they want more. They don't want to settle for the house in this zip code. They want the mansion on the hill. They don't want to settle for the four-door sedan, so they want the SUV. This is what we call the rat race. Running after the morsels that shaitan is deceiving you with, your own selfish desires, instead of the full rewards of Jannah. Your mother, your brother, or your cousin is laying there sick on, your death, on their deathbed and you can't even take a day off to go visit them. But let your boss ask you for a favor. Something simple like, hey, can you grab me coffee with you tomorrow morning? You'll see someone skipping Fajr prayer on time, subhanAllah, in hopes of some promotion. A man works for 50 years to build up an inheritance for his children, 
and at the end, it ends up destroying the family as he passes. Everyone fighting over who will get what. Start putting an end to this today. Talk to your children about what your goals for them are after you pass. Call that brother that you've been feuding with for years. And when they ask you, what do you want? Just say, I just want to check on you, that's all. As-salamu alaykum. Do this for a month and watch both hearts begin to soften. Instead of ignoring the problems and adding fuel to the fire that shaitan has set between you. Wallahi, as the Quran says, all of our problems are surely from our own hands. وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ Allah says, whatever, whatever affliction befalls you, it is because what your own hands have committed. وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ Self-sabotage. Who else do you have to blame other than yourself? You can change it, but you don't want to. You don't want to forget. Put yourself and your emotions aside from it and do the right thing, the thing that will please Allah. And don't let problems just sit there and fester. And people wonder why we miss being kids so much. As a kid, you can fight someone in the morning and be playing with them that afternoon. But what has changed on the road to adulthood or maturity? Somewhere along the way, we have lost our childlike nature. And I think Hamza Yusuf put it best when he said, that childlike nature is a quality that's admirable. But when we mature, we should avoid doing things that are childish in nature. The ability to forgive is certainly childlike. And for our hardened hearts, I think an intellectual approach serves best. Because as adults, we need explanations for everything. And there is no explanation better than the word of Allah. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ مِنَ الْمُرْسِلِينَ إِلَّا إِنَّهُمْ لَيَأْكُلُونَ الطَّعَامَ وَيَمْشُونَ فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْدَكُمْ لِبَعْدٍ فِتْنَةٍ أَتَصْبِرُونَ We have never sent a messenger before you, O Prophet, who did not eat food and go about the marketplaces. And we have made some of you a trial for others. Will you not then be patient? And it says your Lord is all seeing. And if you think of it from that perspective, understanding that not only do material aspects of this world offer you no value in the hereafter, so they should be placed at a lower priority and importance in life, and that most people are made specifically just to test you, then it becomes a lot easier to forgive. So what if someone curses at you? Do you have to curse them back? Just because your child gets into a car accident, so what? Is it just now that you don't trust them driving the car anymore? Or is it just now that you should start paying attention to the friends they have and where they're going at night? You should have been paying attention to this long before. You see issues like divorce, inheritance issues, jobs, health, all these are matters of the dunya. Selfishness is the only reason that you begin to judge other people for their actions or behavior. It is Allah who allowed these things to happen to you. And certainly, He's allowing it to happen either as a test or a judgment for you, a reward or a consequence. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, said, Verily, people were judged by revelation in the time of the Messenger وسلم, and the revelation has ceased. We now only judge what is manifested outwardly by your deeds. Whoever shows us good, we will trust him and bring him close. It is not for us to judge any of his inner secrets. Allah will hold him accountable for what's inside. Whoever shows us evil, we will never trust him, even if it is said that their intentions are good. SubhanAllah. This is reflected in the example of most homeless people. They approach someone for money and the brother says, no, 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 this guy looks like a junkie, man. I'm not going to give him money. Yahya, that's not the point. You are the one being tested, not them. Allah is using them to test your will. It is your obligation as a Muslim to give to the needy. And the Quran says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ Certainly, you will be tested with something of fear, hunger, loss of wealth, and loss of life. And that most certainly was their time of testing. And Allah is using them to test you as well. You have no idea the circumstances that led that person to become like that. What has made our hearts so cold that we can't see these things anymore? When we were children, we all used to eat out of the same bag, drink out of the same bottle, the same plate, the same spoon. When your parents gave you a bag of chips, you used to share with the same neighborhood. And now we can barely share the same air. We need six feet, right? SubhanAllah. 
I can personally recall so many situations where I received help from strangers, where help came from the least expected sources, because they passed their test. They helped a stranger stranded at a gas station. They offered food or shelter to a homeless person. They did not judge and label. They dealt with reasoning from their heart to please Allah, and that's the only purpose, not out of selfishness. So forgive, my brothers and sisters. Forgive yourself, first of all. Forgive your parents. Forgive the ones that are testing you. Forgive the ones that are being tested. It's not their fault. Pardon their mistakes and their shortcomings. وَلَا يَأْتَلِلُوا الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا إِلَى الْغُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْيَعْفُ وَالْيَسْفُحُ أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Do you not love to be forgiven by Allah? وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Ya Salaam Forget about everything else and forgive. I assume by this age most listening to this have already forgotten your obsession with clothes when your parents were the ones buying them for you. Do you remember how important it was to have those Nike shoes? Do you remember cleaning them with a toothbrush because they had to be perfect? Do you remember when this stopped? Most likely it's when it became something you can afford on your own. Something within your possession or your reach. Something disposable and replaceable. Now you have a closet full of shoes and a fridge full of food, so who cares what you'll eat tonight? And if all else fails, there's takeout or delivery. Do you see my point? For a homeless person, there is no fridge. And you're asking them, why don't they go get a job? If they spend all their hours of the day finding a job, do you think they'll have something to eat that night? But all of this is besides the point. I shouldn't have to provide you these logical explanations to eradicate the rationale that shaitan has implanted in your head. Allah and Al-Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed us to take care of the needy. That should be enough. And in reality, if we were doing this as we were instructed, those same people wouldn't be out on the streets begging in the first place. Brothers and sisters, if Allah has afforded you even this little comfort in life of having a job instead of begging on the streets, of having a bed to sleep in, of having friends, to have a wife, to have children, and cars and wardrobes, you owe it to Him to be thankful for that and to forget it. Because you cannot take any of these things with you. Reprogram yourself so that your goals are not, how can I get a better job? How can I make more money? I want to buy a newer car. These are frivolous trials that distract you from something that is not guaranteed. And Jannah is not guaranteed. You have to earn it. Make that your priority. Build your entire life around being a better Muslim and wallahi, all these things will follow. Stop building associations in your head based on the systems that you've been institutionalized in. Always questioning. It's one of the first things that we learn in school. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. They call it 5W1H. And this is how we're taught to collect, digest, and process information, especially when it comes to problem solving. Who did it? Automatically looking for someone to blame. What happened? Before we even ask, are you okay? Where were you? When are you going to change? Why are you doing this? Ya subhanAllah. Allah is the who, and you are the why, and nothing else matters. You've been placed on this earth to come out of darkness and into light, and it's time for this ummah to let go. It's time to move on, forgive and forget, and inshallah then and only then will we have a chance at remembering what we are doing here, where we really came from, and most importantly, where our final destination is when the hour comes and how to stay on the path that'll get us there.